and um, let's go to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to get into this one a little more. Um, um, really throughout right here. But it's Romans 1.17. <coughs> For in it the righteousness of God, for in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over this part called faith brings conformity, and again we're we're covering some things, but we're adding to it a little bit here um, before we get into some major stuff, probably next week. Uh, part of our faith in him entails uh, how he deals with his enemies. Okay, so part of the faith, or, or really a huge part of it, and, and you know what, you see that in, you see that in Romans uh, 12, 13, you know, on to 16, you really see that a lot of these issues are how you're dealing with enemies or with people that, that disagree with you or people that have another opinion, uh, to you and the faith folks is life out of death and that's how he dealt with his enemies that's how Jesus by the cross I'm still up here I guess um, and instead of destroying them or refuting them or or exposing them or on and on and on all the things that we do he that he didn't do um, and and I think that if we could grasp that the just living by faith has a lot to do with how you deal with your enemies, it would make a big difference in our life. I really believe that. I really believe that. The cross tells that story. Instead of destroying them, he dies for them. Instead of punishing them, he bears their punishment for them. The faith of many may embrace the gospel of salvation, but the clarity of our faith sees it as the gospel of the crucified, meaning the, you can see a cross, you know, and people can wear a crucifixion that, or a crucifix that doesn't have Christ on it. And you can see the cross and say, and think, that's, that's my salvation. But we need to begin to see the crucified, not just the crucifix. Does that make sense? We need to see the crucified. And in comprehending him, you comprehend the crucifix, you comp comprehend the wood, you comprehend the event, you, co you comprehend the um, all aspects, including the abuse, including the unfairness of the situation and all the things that, that trip us up. <clears throat> However, their faith does not just extend to him and uh, and as to how he operates. In other words, they believe in the gospel of salvation, but it doesn't extend to the crucified and how he operates. It's, again, this, see this thing about it being an event, the cross being an event, is a big deal because it says to people it's, it was just an event and therefore um, Jesus came down one time and he died and made a big splash and now it's all over with, and he only did that once. But that, that nature is always, the lamb is still on the throne. Do you see what I'm saying? The lamb is on the throne. <clears throat> um, in embracing him, we embrace his way. Take up your cross, follow me. Okay, his way is to the cross. And to follow Jesus involves a cross. Um, we conform unto him. We conform unto his death. Both are mentioned. Being made conformable unto his death. We be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay. The New Testament reveals God as known in this character as exemplified by the cross. The character of, of being somebody important. See, a lot of times we get upset because 
people don't treat us as important, and maybe we're not as important as we think. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I've done that. You know, I mean, Lord, let me tell you, he's put me through the grinder in the past, okay? <laughs> he, and, he, and I deserved every ounce of it. I'm glad he did it. It, was, it. it saved me, and I look back on those times. I don't remember most of the good times and the big da-da-da-da. I remember those times when God dealt with me, and he got me through it, and he revealed his son in me. And... <clears throat> You know, I get upset when somebody didn't acknowledge me or, or, you know, look at me as important. And then I realized, first of all, I'm not that. I'm, I'm, I'm presenting myself higher than I should. But second of all, that's not his way. That's just not his way, period. And if I'm going to claim that I'm going to follow him... I need to follow him in his way, too, as, which is, is his nature. But, I mean, again, there's that we, we, we have to conceptualize it first before it can be made practical as a nature in us. Or we don't know what we're conforming to. We're just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I read my Bible, and I believe that over years I'm slowly conforming to Christ just because I'm a Christian I read my Bible. Not necessarily. There are a lot of attitudes and stuff that never get changed. And we carry those around into the, into the church and expect everybody to accept this. Well, God doesn't accept that. And I don't mean he, he rejects us, but he, he accepts his son, and that's not his son. So it's, to him, it's not, I'm rejecting you. It's more, I accept my son, and I'm not seeing him here. We're not talking about if you're saved or not here. We're talking about your walk. The just shall live by faith. Um, it is by the cross that we understand the crucified one. It's by the cross that we most clearly, and again, I mentioned it in the last class, but Jesus walked this earth selflessly, giving himself in a million different ways. Nobody recognized it as out of the ordinary except for, well, he's a kind man or a miracle worker. So he's a, or a prophet. But it's like, you know, they didn't say, oh, my God, this guy's completely different than all of us. You know, they didn't. And, in fact, many of them could look at that and attributed to him demons. Okay. So, so um, I'm going to say that he probably assumed that all that he did was not bearing fruit. And that's when he said, except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. Okay, I have to die if I'm going to really, something's going to happen here. Um, so, the, so the cross. But see, there had been, there'd been I, I think from what I've read, millions of people who've been crucified on Roman crosses. That wasn't, that wasn't new, and it wasn't just one or three guys, and oh my God, you know. It was just widespread in the Roman Empire. So what made Jesus is different? Nothing until the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to the guy, the crucified. It meant nothing to them. It didn't change one single life without the Holy Spirit revealing the nature of the one that's up there. Not just that he was God, but that God is this way. Amen? Not just that he's God. And, and I know in our early going, we have, to, we have to make our way through all these parts and stuff. Well, God did this. Well, yeah, he did. But, but God did not just do that. This, this most exemplifies, this cross most exemplifies what our God is like. That's, so if, if there's an, even an iota of believing that, then that should motivate us to the word and to the, the Lord and to a heart that says, reveal yourself to me. You know, some of you remember when I led worship last week and I, you know, I, I, all I want is to know you and, you know, um, somebody wanted me to listen to the thing and I started listening to it and I just went, this is, I can't listen to this. This, I was pouring out my guts. I was, I was dying and crying and, and with every, with the deepest core of my being saying, I've got to know you and I can't make it a song. 
you know, I can't do that. I can't, I mean, I can, yes, I'll sing it again or whatever, but I can't, I can't, it, for me, it can't be a song or it's over with. Then it's over with. And then I'll never, I'll lose it and I'll lose the track I was on and I'll, I'll make it plain, you know, just plain old this and I'll miss the Lord and doggone it, I'm not going to miss the Lord. I am not, and I'm not going to quit, and I'm not going to stop. I am, I'm busting down the walls, man. I'm going, you know, when, the, when David said, you, you can run through a, what is it, run through a troop and jump over a fence or something like that. Well, we go, oh, hey, he's made me a, you know, I'm a track star. He ain't talking about being a track star. He's talking about th that your desire to get after the Lord. I will run through that thing. I'll jump over that. I'm going after the Lord. You know, David, you know, what was his usual motivation when he wrote that stuff? It was about the Lord. <clears throat> I guess I do get, I get kind of wired up, don't I? But I, I didn't even realize it until Cassie said something. She said, this was when I was there recently, and she said, uh, Dad, um, I was gonna, I was gonna, take a break from working on the stuff that I work on, the, the insurance stuff, and, and I thought I'd just lay down and, and you know, listen to a teaching. And she said, Dad, if I'm gonna rest, I can't listen to you. <laughs> she said, I can't listen to you. She said, you get going and you just, you become a maniac and you're just like, you know, but I'm dying and she's going, I have to listen to somebody more calm. <laughs> If she's on there, she'll tell you that that's, that's what happened. That's what she said. <clears throat> so my last sentence that I read is that it is by the cross that we understand the crucified one. Okay. But, but what I mean is he is more clearly identified at the cross. A lamb would be an altar, a cross. A lamb, especially for the, the, the Jews and especially for that time period, you would, you would recognize more of what his spirit is than if he did a healing or something. Because you could just call him a healer. You know what I mean? Or a prophet. Or a, and there were a lot of prophets and there were a lot of men of God that did healings or miracles could happen or stuff like that. I mean, you know, I've often said this, that, you know, and it dawned on me one time that Paul, for him, the gospel, because he was Jewish, for him the gospel wasn't that... Um, uh, that now God, you know, God will do miracles and Jesus walked around and did miracles and he did healings and he did all this stuff because the Jews knew that that was, a, if you look at their history, that was a regular part of their relationship with God. And I had to ask myself, and I did this, I had to face, I went, then what was it that was new in the new covenant to Paul if it wasn't all that? Because to the Gentiles, we go, oh, we never saw him. Miracles, and we never saw all this stuff, man. This is this is amazing. As if that was the new covenant, when that was happening in the old covenant. And he said, the cross was what was new. The cross was what was new, and the life of Christ was what was new. And that we we're not just saved from hell; we're born again. You, know, you see the difference? I'm not just saved from hell. I'm born again of incorruptible seed. Well, who's that? That is not me. That is not me. You know, and, and God let Peter go through all of that junk to, to bring him to the place where in, in 1 Peter or 2 Peter where he wrote, it's 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 21. He, he wrote and he says that we are being born again, not of corruptible seed, but by incorruptible, by the word which liveth, not just the scriptures, the word which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, so why did he, why would, he, why would he do that? Because every time he would try to do something right, scriptural, religious, whatever, whatever context you want to put it in for Jesus or with Jesus, it turned out bad. And he, and he you know, so at the end he denies the Lord. When Jesus on that same day said, you're going to deny me not once, but three times, you think you're committed. You're not committed. 
because commitment ain't enough. See, you can say, you can say, I'm committed. You say, well, you, you're committed, but commitment is not enough. Even if you were fully committed, it's going to take, you're going to have to see your absolute inability. You're going to have to be like Sarah. Remember last class when we read about Sarah? And it really says she received strength because she was past the age. In other words, she was past the time she could have done that on her own. But she received strength. She didn't muster it up. And so when you, you recognize this, this way, this faith of Abraham, you recognize this way, you recognize then, then the path that, that Peter took was the best path. You know, I mean, God has us all on a different path to get us there, and he knows exactly what we need. But my point by saying that is it was the best path so that when Peter finally gets, you know, it's over with uh, as far as walking with Jesus and the death has happened and everything, and, and he thinks, man, you know, I was with Jesus, and this was the best thing in the world, and this was the life of Christ, and this was really the only thing I've ever had that was really of God, and I screwed it all up, and what am I going to do? And, you know, and then he has to live with that for a few days, but then, bam, what happens? The resurrection himself shows up. He doesn't resurrect Peter. He shows Peter, this is, this is you. This is what you're like. You, you're going to do this. And then Peter writes, thank God we're born again. But he doesn't just go, I'm born again, I'm born again, and you are too, and so are we, and let's dance and be happy. Well, okay, good. Praise God. I'm not against that, but I'm pro incorruptible seed in me <laughs> thank god that's it's first peter 1 21 or 23 what is it 23 um all right so it is by the cross that we understand the crucified that being said yet it is a fact that many believers claim to believe in the crucified but have no likeness to him okay we're not why would I write that? I'm not trying to put down other people. I'm trying to wake us up. You see what I'm saying? I'm, it, you know, that would convict me. It did. The Holy Spirit gave it to me. I wrote it. <laughs> you know, that we, we have no likeness to him. What, what, you know, I was talking to somebody today about that. I, what kind of pastor would I be? What kind of son of God would I be? If I preached Christ crucified and had no likeness hardly at all, just, you know, it's just me and God just loves me and accepts me the way I am and all this stuff and has this spirit of, that, is, that is not, um, I keep using the word, but not passionate. And the reason why I use the word is it's not it's just not committed, but see, then that's a religious thing, and you got to get committed. But passionate is something in my heart needs to be burning for the Lord. You know, there needs to be, you know, we're, we're the church, the seven-branch candlestick, and something needs to be burning. You know what I mean? And, and that's the way it works. It's, that's part of it. There is that burning, and there is that passion. And if we don't have that, then we're never going to press past the ordinary. We will accept the ordinary. And we will, and we'll accept, and you know what, the, what we'll accept most as ordinary? Us. We'll say, well, it's just the way I am. Well, how about, ah! I mean, I'm just saying, how about, no! I can't live with that. I can't live with that. I, oh, how about this? I can't live without Jesus. I can't live without him. Sure, oh, sure you can, brother. Calm down. I've had people tell me this. In our Bible school, not someone most of you would recognize right off, but said, why do you get so stirred up and everything, you know? And I'm, I, I just, I want Jesus, and I want us all to get more of Jesus. Well, it's just, you know, kind of like blind Bartimaeus situation. Just calm down, you know? Jesus is here. I'm going, well, he ain't that much here. <laughs> not, as much as, not as much as I want. And if my measure is not satisfied, imagine God the Father's measure who wants more of Jesus. 
But if my measure is satisfied, there is no way that my measure meets what the Father's measure is. There's no way. It's just not possible. So, so what? So then what have I got to do? I've got to break out of the ordinary. I've got to break out of the chains of religion that are holding me to something that, that is keeping me from Jesus. It's holding me to something that is keeping me to Jesus. And I can't, I'm, you know, oh, the way we say it in Texas, I can't abide that. <laughs> I can't abide that. And I say that for, for us. We can't. We can't abide that. We can't allow, you know, and, and if we, you know, if we could see into the spirit and if, if, if it looked like we were chained like this, spiritually the enemy had us chained and had us tucked away in a little dungeon of, of his making that was not very wide and didn't have much, you know, and we could actually see that spiritually, we would get mad and go, I, I, the devil is not going to do this to me. The devil is not Lord. The devil is not God. This is, there is no way that this needs to be the case. And we would, we would write, we would, you know, start calling out the people in the other cells. Let's break out of this place. Let's get up. Well, that's what's going on now with us and with many of those that are on Skype and, and in other countries and other, other cities. But, man, from week to week, from, from one Sunday to the next, it's like, you know, it's like the, the wind can go out of our sails and then we're just, ooh, you know, and now we're just sitting in a placid lake or something. Blow, Holy Spirit, blow. You know, and don't get, don't get complacent with, with the Lord because that's what it is. It's being complacent with the Lord. Um, but some have no likeness to him. What does this mean? It means that if the basic premise of the cross as well as the faith of Abraham is that life, coming out of uh, life comes out of death, then they have only believed it as a principle or as a concept by which they're saved. Okay. That's okay initially, but that's not okay with God ultimately. Till we all come to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. And he's talking to church people there. See, Paul didn't visit churches and say, everything's okay. <laughs> I mean, he shared the cross, man. And he, was, he, was, he was on them in a good way. He was going, man, this is Jesus. And you just listen, you know, all the, the Romans, all the depth, both of the height and the length of Christ, and, and, da, 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 and he just loses it while writing to them. And they go, dude, just tell us what you want, you know, what you want to say. You don't need to wax eloquent with your little, you know, tirades of passion for Jesus. But he had to. He had to. To them it has not become a faith by which they live. The just shall live by faith. In other words, they have a belief system, but do not walk by the faith that saved them. All right, so now we're going to talk officially about the just shall live by faith. Romans, as well as other books, declares that, we, that the just live by faith. live by it. Okay, so what would that say about Abraham? What would that say about Abraham and Sarah? It would say that in reality once they became too weak to produce anything they lived they lived by that. Now uh, I'm sure I'll get into it here somewhat but not enough you should just read the book of James in, in light of faith. People have a wrong concept of James, but all James is saying is basically that if it's real, if it, you really believe this, the right thing, not, this, not that my Savior died 2,000 years ago and I believe in the event and I believe that if I believe that, I'll be saved. That's not, that's not it. James is saying, if you believe this, then it's going to cause you to live a certain way. And he used Abraham 
offering up Isaac as an example. Was not Abraham justified when he offered Isaac? You say, but you, you can say this. So you can say, no, no, it says, um, it says in uh, Genesis 15 that at that point, which, which uh, Isaac and offering him up was in 22, way later, uh, in 15, God says that you're justified by faith. But James says, no, you, yes, God pronounced it, but it wasn't fulfilled until he was willing to lay down or give the son in death. It, it's not fulfilled. It has to be faith. He says, therefore, faith without works is dead. That's his conclusion. That this, that the, you know what it, the, all that section is? It's all summed up in these words. The just shall live by faith. You live by it. You don't just have an event. You know, Abraham and Dan, they believed, you know, at the birth. He kept going all the way to 22. You see that? And so it's important that we, you know, if it says that the faith of Abraham, we need to follow that out past one scripture in chapter 15. <clears throat> Since the just live by faith, therefore the Christian life is meant to be a faith journey or a manner in which we approach life, not merely what we believe about salvation. Faith was never meant to be a one-time act so that a Christian might from then on be passive, meaning one-time act. Um, okay, uh, Spirit of God's moving. If you want to receive Jesus, come down to the altar and we'll pray for you, and you just release your faith and you'll be saved. Okay, so you go, okay, praise God. You go down the altar and you pray and you release your faith. And then to you, faith was a one-time event that, and pretty much you're passive on many fronts anyway from then on. Whereas Paul and the others saw this, as, saw the, they saw the cross as ongoing. Jesus said, you want to follow me? Take up your cross and follow me. But follow you? No. Follow Christ crucified. Follow the cross and Christ. There are some people who believe in Christ, but, but they don't, they're crossless faith. There's some people who believe in the cross, but it, it's, a, it's a Christless cross. They just believe in dying or, or suffering or, you know what I mean. We believe in Christ crucified. And to take up the cross and follow him means you're looking at the cross and you're looking at him. You're not just seeing Jesus, you know, Jesus of Nazareth. You're seeing the lamb on the throne that is still ongoing. He's still the lamb. He's still a slaughtered lamb. He's still selfless in his giving. He's still, uh, you know, he, he ever lives, meaning this spirit still lives to make intercession on your behalf while he, instead of coming and honoring and saying, Jesus, you're everything, I love you, I da da da, -da. You, don't, you, don't, you know, people, individually, you don't hear that, that a lot of people do that, that they come and they just go, oh, I'm gonna take some time in prayer. Jesus, I just love you, I just, I love your spirit, I love your nature, I love the way that you are, and just pour out on him for the beauty of who he is. Rather, they come in there and it's like a, a, a quick, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to use it in uh, food, but, you know, a uh, fast food place. You know, we come in, da -da -da, here's what I want, you know, da -da -da, we'll pull into the next window and the Holy Spirit will give it to you. You know what I mean? No, no. So, so he ever lives to make intercession for us. And do we stop and say, hold it. No intercession today. I just want to acknowledge and spend some time loving on you. I just want to love on you a little bit. Why? Well, because I see the beauty of who you are. And I appreciate that you make intercession for me and everybody else all the time, and that's all you do. But I just want to stop the madness for a minute and tell everybody else, y'all, leave him alone for a minute. Let's just honor him for who he is. 
Let's just focus on him and not what he's going to do for us. Anyway. And there it is. See, it says, uh, the scriptures portray the cross as an ongoing reality. In the Bible, faith is too deeply tied to our death with Christ to only view it as an initial act of salvation. This kind of faith gets us involved and causes action. The book of James confirms that faith without works is dead. What does that mean? It means that true faith expresses itself or that it has an outward expression of selfless giving, but it's not, it's, okay. But it's not selfless giving, it's Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not, it is selfless giving, but it's Christ doing the selfless giving. It's not so, acts of selfless giving. And it's not acts of sacrifice. It's Christ. And if it's not Christ, then we're monks. You know, whether it be Buddhist or, or Catholic or whatever, we're just doing without. And it's not about doing without. And it's not about suffering. It's about letting Christ live. That's why he made us his body. We're his body. You know, we say, no, this is my body. No. <laughs> you know? No, this is mine. No, it's not. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. Why do you, why do you resist? Why do you resist the Holy Spirit? Is that man or devil back there? <laughs> Boy. To James, it is this outward expression that proves that the person has the right kind of faith. Okay, but you can't concentrate on the outward expression. You concentrate on the life, the nature. You concentrate on Jesus. All right, when the Bible declares in several places that the just shall live by faith, it emphasizes the word live. This is not just believing in salvation. This is a faith that, that you live by. It is asserting that whatever faith that you embraced that brought about justification has also expanded that faith into a manner of proceeding in life, or it has become a lifestyle. If you are justified by faith in his death, then you will live by that same kind of faith in your walk. He's saying... Because why? Live, life, life. What did we receive? Did we, did we receive life? And if we didn't receive life, then no wonder we're the same old person that we were before we met Jesus, except for we sanctified part of our, you know, part of our outward things. The faith of the believer is a part of his walk, his life, his way, and is founded upon his own crucifixion with Christ. This faith is not just in what Jesus did on the cross for us, but includes the motivation to live according to it, since what is believed has to do with life. The motivation to live according to what we've seen. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself. I live this way because he did it this way. That's exactly what it's saying. <clears throat> Faith is our response to Christ crucified. Okay. That sounds like a simple uh, statement, but it's not. Faith is our response to Christ crucified. We think faith is our response to what Jesus got for us, salvation. But faith is a response to Christ crucified. You know, I don't want to get into this too much, but it is just a fact that faith has to have an object. Did you know that? The very grammatical word and the way, the way that the word faith is used is not just like resurrection. It's not something out there you know, all on its own out here, and you just go, okay, you know, faith, I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna, 
I'm going to be a faith person. Faith has to have an object, and the object of our faith is supposed to be Christ. I'm going to be a Jesus person. You understand what I mean? Just trying to communicate that you don't, if, if something can't exist, if the object, okay, so here's faith, and if the object is like this, this big old circle, notice I got the cross in there, if that's the object of your faith, then faith can't be, we can't lift that out of its context and just make faith anything that we want. Let's just aim it at anything or let's just, let's just have faith. Well, I'm a faith person. Yeah, well, what's your object? <laughs> just, I'm just, just to believe, I believe. What do you believe? Well, I, I believe I'm saved, but that's not really their object, that's the, that's the result, you know. And, and I'm telling, you know, the reason why I'm telling you this stuff like this, this is what I went through. You know, I didn't get this on a mountaintop. I got this stuff by the Lord challenging me and going, you know, you, you, you know, I'm diligent, I'm searching, and then I'm looking up, and then I look up faith, and I check it, and da-da-da-da, and I go, oh, man, in the gra in a grammatical setting, faith has to have an object. And then I have to confront myself, and I have to be open, and I have to go, then my, my emphasis that I had on just faith, and well, let's just have faith, and faith here, faith there, and faith that, needs to be challenged. And if I'm gonna learn or know the Lord correctly, I must start slapping myself in the face and going, look here, buddy, you stop hiding your head under, you know, sticking your head in the sand and, go, and, and excusing, you know, all this stuff, let it expose what you thought was the truth, and then let the Holy Spirit say, but let me reveal Christ as the truth. And see, I wrestled with that early on. So did Paul, didn't he? He, re he wrestled with Paul being, uh, with uh, Jesus being the truth, the center of this whole thing. You know, well, this can't be right, you know? And he had to wrestle through pretty bad. Well, I, I did too. I had to wrestle with it. And I wrestled with Jesus being, you know, well, wait a minute. Well, but, but you see, the reason why I felt like I had an argument was I had, a, in a sense, a, cro a Christless cross. I believed the cross of salvation saved me. And it, and it didn't, I mean, yes, Jesus was the one who died. But it was, again, just an event. And as long as I saw it as an event, there was no demands put on me. It was just Jesus, Jesus did this, and I'm, you know, and I'm free. That's what, and that was the way I proceeded. I'm free. Um, faith is our response to Christ crucified. The believer in Galatians 2.20 recognizes that whatever blessings and benefits that come to him from God came through death unto life by means of Christ crucified. In other words, he starts recognizing the crucified, and he goes, it didn't just come through the cross, magically through the cross. Well, it's the cross, it's the cross. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> it's Christ crucified. It is this Lamb of God that gave himself. And quit, quit making two pieces of wood the grand focus of everything and see the nature of the one who did it instead of, again, like a Christmas tree, just seeing all the benefits and we only see the tree, which is the wood. The, we don't see the source. We don't see the one from whom all of this came and it was the crucified one. It was a crucified one. And to stop and to say, I want, I need to know him, and I need to quit focusing on the doctrines of, of what the cross has brought me. Almost finished here. 
Therefore, for the believer to have faith in the cross means that he has come to faith in the master pattern described by the phrase life out of death. The master pattern is just the cross or, or Christ crucified. And it is, it is a template. You take this cross and you lay it over. And this is what Paul did in Philippians. He took the cross of Philippians 2 and he described it perfectly. And then he took it and in the next chapter he laid it over his life and it is an exact pattern of chapter 2. It's an exact pattern of chapter 2. People who have faith in the cross of our own crucifixion also are the ones who are given access into the realm of Jesus' life and resources. We call it in Christ. But see, in Christ becomes a doctrine then. And we say, well, I'm in Christ. And, and I know all the teachings of, of being in Christ. And yet we've never really gained access into the realm of Jesus' life and resources in terms of being. We've only gathered what we can get that fall from the tree. And um, Esther's a perfect example of that. Esther's a perfect example of that. Before that, she, didn't, she knew there was a king. She was in the kingdom, da-da-da-da, but she had a lot of faults. She had a lot of lack. She had a lot of this and that. But when she came into union with him, she wasn't just queen. She came into the access, how did I word that? The, the access into the realm of Jesus' life and resources. She came into him. She's quit being what she was, saved in the kingdom, knowing the king, all that stuff. And she, she, she started being melded into him. That's in Christ. It's not some doctrine that you just, because the, the doctrine of it for most people that I've seen, it has no power. It really has no influence. It has absolutely almost nothing of impact in their life. They're, it doesn't impact their life, especially not on a daily basis. If you sat them down, they could probably explain how theologically, oh, well, you're in Christ and therefore da 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 da. But that's drawing a circle and calling it in Christ and being in Christ and then teaching that is a far cry from. from Jesus being there and you say, I want to enter into you. I want access into you, not just this. And you're meld into him so much so that you're one now. And what he is, you're drawing from. You're a branch. You're his branch. You're not just a branch. You're his branch. And that's how you get his stuff to pop out of you. It's called fruit. That's how it happens. And when you do that, you've, you've entered into, you know, again, that, the union, uh, Esther, the, the union is, is, it's intimate, isn't it? It's not theological. It's not theory. It's intimate. It's Jesus. It is it is knowing him in a way that changes you because, because you're, you're, you're in union. You're, how do you describe it? See, only the Holy Spirit can describe it. I can't, I can't do it. I'm an idiot. But I know that, that Jesus wants that. Here's the problem. When we make it theological, we don't even think about what Jesus wants. It's always just the, the, the I, all I need to know is the facts. Just give me the facts, ma'am. You know, that's, that's the deal. So that's our mentality, and that's how we approach it. And Jesus is standing there and going, you're not functioning by union. You're not functioning by oneness. You're not functioning as a branch, my branch. You're not functioning as my anything. You're functioning as you for me, but you're still over there, and I'm here, and this is the, here's the basis of your understanding is a chalkboard. God, and he, day after day, 
week after week, month after month. Year, I mean, how long has this church been going? Surely the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. Surely he was. And we never stepped into him. We never, we never, see, we never saw his heart. And in seeing his heart, he says, come boldly. But that's, that's just like, that's like saying, come on. You know, that's what it is. It really is. It's like, it's come on. I'm here. I'm, I'm here now. And you're one with me on this throne. I've seated and you're seated with me, but you're still acting over there. Come boldly in here. And let's, you know, be what we are instead of being this religious thing. And how much more should that must that kill Jesus since he came down here and was slaughtered to end that way of relating to him, to literally end it. And so now we're, we're claiming that we're one with him. Oh, I'm in Christ. I can, I can draw a circle. <laughs> I'm, one with, I'm one with him. But there's, but there's none of that reality. So it's, what are we, Jews now? Yes. To him, it's just like, we're, well, you're just Jude, it's Judaism all over again. There's a total lack of, of this access that when he talks about access, this access to me that I gave, I paid for in my blood. And, and okay, so let's add, let's add misery to pain here, and that is we don't even... We don't even either know that we're that way, or if we even suspect that we are, do we cry out with all of our heart? Do we cry out with all of our heart, or do we say, oh, you know, you're still over there, and I'm here, and uh, just draw me, but not too fast. <laughs> you know, just draw me, but not too fast. Uh, let's let's make this last. Let's see, 40, 50 years. Yeah, 40 years of wandering is best. 40 years. Let's let, let's just not you know, let's just not rush this thing. And he's going. I've already died for it, and now you're killing me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean I'm not. Yeah. But I mean now you're killing me because we should already be there and we're not there. Well. We can, we can blame religion all we want, <clears throat> but that doesn't justify our heart for not getting up and going after the Lord. And I'm, that's, not, that's not condemnation. That is, it's meant to be not condemnation, but motivation. That's all, that's all. We're in this time period, it's his time. It's not, it's not ours. Let's give him what he, he deserves, uh, more than even what he deserves. Let's give him what's in his heart, not because he deserves it, not just because he deserves it, because then that be, we're trying to repay. Let's just give him what's in his heart because we love him. If we don't love him, let's just tell him that and say, well, I'd rather be a Christian. But if we love him, then let's tell him by doing that. Let's move. Anyway. Boy, not a good place to stop right here. I tell you, I just, ah. the zeal of the Lord's house has eaten me up. We just got to get to a place where we're more in tune and in touch with him than we are with our life down here. We just got to get there. We really do.
We're so far from that. Father, we just, we just ask you to continue to, to move in the manner that you are. But Lord, if you need to kick it up, if we can handle it, then do it. But Lord, there's just something. There's just something stirring that needs to move eventually. Not Maybe not today, not this week, not this month, but something that is stirring with us, within us, that needs to break past just being stirred. We need to start getting bold. We need to start getting a passion to get to you no matter what. Father, thank you that you have us where you have us. But we're just saying, Father, we really don't want us to stay here. Thank you. This, this is wonderful. You are wonderful. But we need Jesus. We need the scales taken off of our heart and off of our eyes. So help us, help us break out of the fetters that hold us and that keep us complacent. Shake us. Hallelujah. And awaken us. Awaken our spirit. Awaken our, the spirit of our mind. We want to see Jesus. And in, being, in seeing him, we want to be transformed into that same image. Jesus, what do you want to be after your kind is what we're telling you. We're telling you we want to be after your kind. Help us. Send the Holy Spirit in ways to help us. Because we want to be after your kind, not for our sake, not to glory in, not to look better than some people look, but because that's what you need. That's what you want. That's what you set this whole thing in motion for and we want to be after your kind. Thank you for what you've done to this point. Thank you. So merciful. So merciful to us. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right.